Hello, welcome to Sunday Science Q&A, where we are uh, here pretty much every single week, apart from occasionally, for instance, when we did the 25-hour uh, live show, which you can still see uh, on YouTube as well, all those different things there, Robert Smith and Tim Minchin and a multitude of scientists and uh, Helen Chersky's puncture repair kit, uh, which she had to take out twice uh, for our opening, but you, you probably know all about that anyway. But anyway, there were 25 hours of stuff. That was one of the rare occasions we weren't on on a Sunday uh, but we're back today we're in particular talking about uh, meteorology we're talking about uh, understanding of climate uh, you've sent in an enormous number of fantastic questions but you can send in live questions as well you can either tweet us at cosmic shambles or you can pop it into the live chat and uh, tell you about a few of the things that are going on at the moment we have uh, the latest book shambles is uh, with Nikesh Shukla uh, about his new book and it's a, it's a fantastic book and he's always someone wonderful to to speak to we've, we've spoken to a few times on book shambles so you can go and find that uh tomorrow we've got uh, a kind of a compilation show of the uncanny hour series that i've done with people like Stuart lee and alan moore and kayla janice and many others uh where we talked about death line and dead of night and why we believe in and uh so you can see a kind of a, a selection of uh of bits and pieces from that series and reese Shearsmith is in that um, anthology as well and then on friday we will have our new episode which is all about john carpenter's apocalypse trilogy which began with The Thing and again Stuart Lee and Rhys Shearsmith are on that uh, and also we have someone who watched The Thing for the first time when they were at the South Pole and uh, I have a physicist explaining the nature of evil and anti-evil we've really kind of you know broadened out this particular or maybe narrowed down anyway some of it's niche and some of it's less niche but uh, that's going to be out on friday um and on wednesday is the next of my reality talks which was going to be more about quantum mechanics than it actually is going to be about because i've become distracted and you can't understand quantum mechanics in any way whatsoever if you become distracted in the build-up but it will be about philip k dick and i'm also joined uh, by john higgs as well who wrote a fantastic book called stranger than we can imagine one of my favorite books and uh it is all about the uh society's ultimate reaction to the loss of the center of the universe no longer were we not in the center of the universe no longer were we not a special animal separate from all of the other animals but also quantum mechanics gave us a world where it was probabilities rather than definites so those are a few things on also in season two of brain yapping uh hosted by dean Burnett and uh and rachel england and that's cosmic shambles.com slash Brain yapping. Oh my God, there's so many things that we're up to at the moment. Anyway, and so thank you very much, everyone who supports us my Patreon as well, because the this is what makes it possible. There's also another new series starting uh, with Tim Minchin and Andre and, and Neil Gaiman and many others as well. So go and find out about that also at our Cosmic Shambles site. Um, so who are we joined by today? We're joined by Dr. Mark Richards, who is a researcher in atmospheric physics at Imperial, Imperial, Imperial College, London, College London, and uh, Aidan and McGiven, who's a meteorologist and weather presenter for the Met Office at ITV. And we're also as usual, joined by Helen Chersky. So first of all, Helen, how are you? Hello, I'm very well. I have spent, well, I spent this morning preparing demos, which I might show you later. But as my introductory thing, I, wanted, thing, to I wanted to tell you about some science that happened this week. And uh, it's, we're going back a little way. It, it, it turned two days February. It was the 96th birthday of the pips, the BBC pips, those things that go beep, 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 beep. Beep, beep. I am not the Pips person. <laughs> um, so, but well, the that's the thing about the Pips. It shows even though you have the tenacity to do physics, you don't have the tenacity not to become bored halfway through doing the Pips. That's what if you really need someone to be an authentic interpreter of the Pips, you have to present all the Pips with chutzpah. By the third Pip, clearly you were bored. Well, I was trying to hurry it up because the whole thing takes there are there are six pips in total. There are five short ones and one long one. And the time uh, the time you spent that's supposed to set your watch is the fir is at the start of the long one. So back in 1924, uh, it's actually um, a, a scientist on the radio had this idea, and then the astronomer Royal and, and Lord Reith got involved, and they said the BBC should broadcast this thing on the hour so that everyone could set their watches. And in a way, the we I mean, this is all about science, but in a way, this is a really fundamental scientific thing. Imagine living mm -hmm. in a world where you couldn't set your watch, right? How do you know if you're making a weather measurement, for example, how do you know exactly what time it is? You've got to go and work out how to set your clock. So this is like, you know, we talk about the universality of time that comes along with a telegraph. Well, this is the democratization of time because everybody could know exactly what time it was. And the system was brilliant. You know, the clocks originally were in the basement of Royal Museum in Greenwich and um, the, the there were clocks based there, but they what they did, which was very clever, was they accounted for the delay thing. So it obviously took time to send 
and the signal to the, t to the BBC time to broadcast it. And they took that into account. So that is it in, you know, Newcastle or wherever, it's actually at the correct time. And and this is actually one of the things that is going to be the demise of the pips because digital radio takes time to encode. Internet radio takes time to encode. And certainly now I don't have a radio that comes via radio waves, right? I listen to, um, I listen to the radio via the internet, which means the pips are late because the delays that they have to things. And so there's this very sad thing that the pips are probably going to reach their 100th birthday and we all like them. But if you actually want to set your watch, by the work anymore but there's one other thing about the pips which i love at the time which just talks a little bit about um the nature of how, how things get done and sometimes being nice to people is is just best altruism and it is that for the first th so the royal navy was running the royal observatory when all when this was started and after 13 years the royal navy person some accounts person noticed that the bbc weren't paying for this service of these clocks. so they sent the bbc a bill and there was a pause. And then the BBC sent back a bill for the shipping forecast, which the Royal Navy had never paid for, and it all went very quiet. Um, so, <laughs> which is just great. Um, so yeah, so it is it is the birthday of the pips, or it was it was two days ago. And yeah, it's just such a great way to share time, and, and we completely take it for granted now. So that's the science from this week in history. I was just going to ask quickly as well, it's interesting when you were talking about the broadcasting of radio signals and then the, the turn towards digital, there is that sense as well. Sometimes when people are talking about us searching for extraterrestrial life, that uh, it might be like our existence, I don't know how you feel about this, that there is a period in civilization where you broadcast and those signals go out across the universe. And there might be a, a period then when you, you close in on yourself again and, and these various different hints of life, such as obviously the Navy lark or Hancock's half hour traveling across the universe, um, that they cease again. So there's this kind of window of, of detection possibilities that vanishes. But what's brilliant about that is it's never going to be the most sophisticated. But what you're sending is always going to be the ver it's like the awkward teenager stage, isn't it? With technology, you do that, you broadcast everything everywhere. When you're on the way up, you haven't quite worked. It's not very complicated yet. Just send everything everywhere. And later on, when you've worked out bandwidth conflicts and energy efficiency and all these other things, that's when you shut down and you kind of become an adult. So what we're broadcasting into the universe is effectively our teenage selves. That's the, te you know, the teenage years of our civilization, And um, that's what the universe is going to see us as. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, now, uh, we're joined, I mentioned before, Dr. Mark Richards from uh, Imperial College, uh, atmospheric uh, physicist. Uh, what have you got for us, Mark? What's your show in today? Today? Oh, right. OK, well, oh, well, welcome, uh, one and all. Um, I, well, it's funny. I, I was caught, kind of caught off guard because I haven't been in the office for for a while. And so I, I, I can't just grab something off the office. Um, so I have to think what I had uh, around me. But then I, I actually came across something uh, which you probably would never seen before. You've never you've never seen it on eBay. Now, it is this. Now, I'll explain what it is. Now, those who recognize Maxwell's equations will know that this is actually a Maxwell's equations puzzle tray. Um, so uh, in addition to uh, a lot of the, the, the research and teaching I do, I'm very keen to sort of inspire the younger generation in science. And so we came up with this idea of having a fun toy, shall we say, uh, but based on something very scientific. So uh, on the back, it's got all the explanation. Well, I say all the explanation of the importance of Maxwell's equations. You probably can't read all that, um, but it explains the importance of Maxwell's equations and how it's played a role in many different areas of technology uh, and so on and explains electromagnetism. But the key thing is that you, you sort of rearrange it and then try to reconstruct Maxwell's equations. So by the time they're reintroduced to Maxwell's equations, if they do study physics, uh, they can happily brag that they constructed Maxwell's equations when they were a young child. Uh, so that's my show and tell, really. And it's really partly about um, shifting the mindset, because part of what I like to do or I try to do is that often um, to, to really engage young people in science, especially those who might not feel that science is a thing for them. It's partly about changing the mindset. And so introducing them to things which they probably uh, wouldn't really experience unless they really studied it. But introducing it at an early accessible stage helps. That, that such that when they then get to a sort of reintroduced to it properly, they've already got a familiarity. And of course, you're planting the seeds. So if we don't explain what all these all these symbols necessarily mean, but anybody with an inquisitive mind can start to probe and research. And of course, I believe that's where science starts with that inquisitive mind. 
So that's basically my show and tell. It's about shifting the mindsets and bringing, if you like, fundamental science much closer uh, to and uh, accessible to, I'll just say, the general public or anybody interested, as opposed to, you know, strictly within a sort of academic realm. Can I ask you, because of that, that's interesting, because I, I, I get equation blindness. You know, when I'm reading a book and I get to an equation, it's it's um, my brain just kind of almost shuts down. It just refuses to. What would you say to people is the best way of, you know, approaching, trying to understand the language of equations? You know, for those people, especially if you're reading, if you're trying to understand quantum mechanics, you know, unless a book is 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 really trying to avoid it there will be a point where you then suddenly hit across something where you see symbols which we're not used to you see them in a kind of an order so what, what would you give a, a, advice for people in terms of trying to break down the information that is within an equation okay i mean it's a good question and it is it, first of all i don't want to give the impression that if someone studies or teaches physics that suddenly they, they can just simply just grasp any equation whatever's thrown at them however difficult it's never like that you have to it's like anything else you've got to you've got to study and learn but the, the key thing that I think uh, when it comes to equations which I always try and remind myself and sometimes remind remind students is that every equation tells a story so sometimes you've got to try and find out what that story you know think about what the story is before what the solution to the equation is especially within something like physics, where it's not a completely abstract subject, like, you know, pure mathematics, where it may not be hung on to something physical. Within physics, most of the time, every equation does paint, a, you know, tell a story. So if you're, if you, so in other words, try and tell the story without the equation. Uh, and then that might help you understand the equations. Uh, but that's just a tip for me. But like I said, everybody's got different learning styles. So uh, it may not work for everybody. But I think I always try and understand what the equation, the equation implies or means physically, if you like, or where I can, because that kind of keeps it in, in my mind, it keeps me grounded, because I wouldn't say I was a pure abstract, you know, mathematician, in that sense, it's more a question of, I want, you know, equations are used to describe um, physical processes. And so I want to understand what it is that it's describing. And, and, you know, when I transform this equation from one stage to the next, what is it trying, what is it trying to tell me, you know, diff, you know, in, in some way, so that's what I try to say. It's not it's not always obvious uh, necessarily, but that approach has helped me at least understand what equations are doing, if you like, and what they're implying, rather than seeing them as just abstract symbols that you have to sort of do some sort of mental gymnastics to understand why one thing relates. to. Yeah, that's interesting. Talking to uh, um, a science teacher friend of mine who says that this is one of the problems with GCSE now is it's mm. become so much about memorizing an equation and that important part of it, that vital part of what is the story? What does it say? Exactly. And so something that is about us and the universe around us becomes something totally abstract. Mm. So this is a conversation we will have much longer another time. Aidan, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm going to go straight in with you as well. What is your show and tell for us today? Uh, hello. First of all, apologies if you can hear some strange noises. My daughter is having an epic tantrum at the moment. And of course, my wife is trying to get her out for a walk. But the, the more she tries, I think the more that my daughter uh, resists. But um, I have, uh, first of all, today marks an important anniversary for me. It's uh, 30 years since it snowed. And I was seven years old and completely captivated by that snow. Uh, the, the wider context of that snowfall was that it led to big disruption for, for the railways and ultimately led to the infamous phrase, uh, wrong type of snow, which um, it came out of British Rail's excuse for the, for the rail disruption. Um, but I captured the uh, snowfall in my seven-year-old diary from February 1991. I wrote all about it and um, just wanted to show you show you my um, diary entry from, from this time 30 years ago. Uh, I think on the, uh, let's see, on the, on the 5th, I heard on the weather that it's going to snow heavily in the night. It's minus five. Next day, didn't snow. <laughs> day after that, so this is the 7th, did snow in the evening. And then several days after that, school was cancelled. I went sledging, built snowmen. And yeah, just loved it. I had the time of my life. What is brilliant about that is that you were seven and you're taking 
like time reference notes. <laughs> I still have <laughs> my students, my university undergraduate students, to, to take time reference notes. I'm very impressed. You clearly had potential from from an early age. <laughs> well, m most of the diary uh, from this point on, um, when there's important web about it's detailed descriptions. Anything else, I don't bother. It's it's <laughs> made by the diary from this point onwards. The following week, uh, it all gets a bit sad, unfortunately. <laughs> snow starts melting <laughs> by the 13th, no snow left. On the 14th, nothing. 15th, nothing. And then the 16th, half term. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's what started it all for me. Uh, just that, uh, the magic of that snow event. Uh, which is remembered for the wrong type of snow excuse from uh, British Rail. But for me, that's what started this lifelong obsession with the weather uh, and in particular snow. And of course, uh, 30 years on, we're still seeing some cold weather and some places are getting some snow this week. So uh, it, it's, it's uh, you know, that excitement has, has never ended for me. Do you still keep a diary? I do, actually. Yeah, I do keep a diary. And, you know, I wish I'd kept more diaries when I was younger because it's absolutely golden reading back some of those entries. I love that idea that if we actually saw the whole of that diary, all it says for the rest of it is no snow. July the 15th, no snow. This was all it was. the. Uh, um, now, in fact, let's start off then with a question for you from Martin. Martin uh, says he wants to say it's, it's rain forecasting. He says, back in my early school days, we learned about the evaporation cycle, thunderstorms, etc. Then in the early 2000s, I recall a BBC weather documentary saying that 70 percent of the science concerning the rain making process had yet to be understood at that time. So his question is, what have been the standout developments in rain forecasting since and what do you anticipate for discoveries to come? Uh, I think what Martin there, was talking you know, about there, you, you know, uh, go into the detail of how rain forms in clouds. And when you look at the really small scale, it starts to get a bit complicated and, and a bit strange. Um, there are there are two main ways that rain forms in clouds. There are warm clouds, so clouds that are above zero and rain tends to form when you get cloud droplets colliding with each other to form bigger and bigger cloud droplets until they get heavy enough to fall from the sky. So that's quite straightforward. But then there's another type of rain formation that we normally get in this country where the clouds are below freezing and can get quite cold indeed. And at that scale, it's not as straightforward to say that below freezing you get ice crystals because you can also get what's called supercooled uh, cloud droplets or, or, or water droplets. And these are water droplets, uh, pure water that don't freeze when the temperature goes below zero uh, because it's quite difficult to freeze pure water. And that's because these tiny droplets, when they're, they go below freezing, when they start to freeze, they'll release energy, they'll release latent heat energy and that will warm them up slightly and so they'll stop freezing. So you really have to be very cold. It really has to be very cold, like minus 40 or so for these water droplets to freeze. And in clouds that are typically minus 15 to minus 40, you tend to get a mixture of these supercooled water droplets as well as ice crystals. And um, there's a lot of uncertainty, or at least I think there used to be a lot of uncertainty about how... Um, ice crystals uh, uh, build up and how these water droplets build up to form ultimately rain droplets. And I think that the, 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 the prevailing idea was that uh, ice crystals would um, almost, because the, well, the, the air was saturated with respect to ice rather than respect to water, so the ice crystals would, would gain water vapour from the atmosphere and grow larger at the expense of the water droplets. And ultimately, you'd get these large ice crystals clumping together, falling out the sky as snow and then probably melting on their way down. Um, in really cold clouds, it would be entirely ice crystals and they'd clump together. Um, but I think at that scale, there's always been this uncertainty exactly about the processes involved in, in how uh, cloud droplets, how ice crystals ultimately form uh, raindrops. And in our um, weather models, in our computer models, where we, we, we model the uh, formation of rain and, 
uh, clouds and so on. This scale is just too small to model. And so we have to do it using something called parameterization, parameterization, uh, in which you kind of estimate uh, broadly what's going on in the cloud. And computer models still struggle with um, these cumulus clouds and the showers that they bring. And so uh, each computer model has different biases or, or different um, uh, ways in which it deals with with shower clouds and and as a meteorologist you learn how to um, you learn what each model's uh, uh, pro you know uh, you learn what each model is good at and what each model is bad at and you take that into account when you're looking at these computer models and how they're they're producing shower clouds and so on. Can I just stick in a little bit a little bit just very briefly because mm. this is of what I study and my colleagues study, which is at every in the centre of every droplet, uh, there's a tiny particle. And some of those particles make it much easier for water to condense and much easier for water to turn to ice. And so the cloud research that I see is, is that it's not all, there's loads of particles in the atmosphere, not pollution, they're, they're there for other, you know, they're naturally. But some of them, especially biological ones, are really good at changing uh, make, helping water condense and changing for water into ice. And, and so my understanding, and certainly what my colleagues are doing in the Arctic, is trying to work out where are these particles coming from? How many are there? Because then we can predict. And like Aidan was saying, we can um, then you've got something to run your simulator with. So yes, tiny Hi. particles are at the heart of all of it. Yeah, exactly. And that's where the idea of cloud seeding comes from. If you can introduce these particles into the, the, the atmosphere, then you can generate rainfall from from cloud seeding. Now we're going to move on. Thank you very much for that for that answer. And I, I think your daughter knows something about the weather that's about to come. By the way, if you're doing a forecast tonight, I think that's why she's refusing to go out at the moment. Uh, I can I can hear she's still quite resistant. Uh, this is a question mark. Uh, Nigel would like to know. He was thinking back to the the Icelandic volcano uh, incident, which led to the grounding of planes for quite some time, and uh, was interested uh, to know. Said there was some controversy about whether it was necessary or not. Why are such small particles in the air so dangerous for aircraft? And how can you detect them from a distance uh for the sake of safety or can you okay uh well um i suppose in in raw terms i mean i by the way i do remember the the, the volcanic ash uh, quite well because it was a uh, it was around april um in 2010 and i remember it well because um it was coming up to a very big milestone of a birthday milestone and i'd booked a weekend uh, with my brother to go and celebrate with some friends in new york and it was a it was a touch and go as to whether the plane was you know whether the flight was going to be uh, allowed and in the end it didn't happen so uh i, I can remember that very well uh the volcanic ash but for different reasons um and yeah so i was i was quite interested in how on earth can these uh these ash clouds or the ash clouds suddenly stop all these planes from flying well i suppose uh, there are a number of different potential reasons i don't can't tell you the specific one but um, the obvious one is visibility, which potentially could be something. But more realistically, I suppose, if you're navigating an aircraft, uh, you might rely on, on uh, infrared, for example, or, or frequencies that, 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 that have to still travel through the air. And if you've got large particles, they can absorb some of these frequencies. So you may get inaccurate readings in, in terms of positioning of aircraft. So I presume, I, I, I presume it was more obviously airing very much on the side of caution because you don't want to take that kind of, 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 of risk. Um, sorry, what was the second part think, of the question? So I might just add something to your particles there because um, a lot of the controversy was about jet engines. Because if you think about a jet engine, you've got components very sensitive that are rotating at phenomenal speeds. And a lot of volcanic ash is basically little bits of glass. Well, and yeah. you know, the danger, um, the, the the debate was because um, because I did some work with Copernicus on because they they're sat, they're monitoring plumes from satellites and the de the deal is can you tell the difference between a plume that will cause harm and a plume that weren't that won't and the airlines are were really cross about the shutdown because they were like this is nonsense none of these plumes are going to cause damage and the problem was nobody knew um, but the jet engine damage to it and they're finding that yeah, actually some remote absolutely. sensing techniques can tell the difference between the really well, yeah. big bits and the smaller ones A absolutely so so i mean that that that, that is, i suppose is part of the the consideration and, and and i don't get it was concern so it's not to say that there was lots of jets you know significantly get, getting damaged but it was a, a legitimate concern going back to the second part of the question which i think was about how do you sort of a bit how do you monitor um, these these various particles then that's that's where remote sensing does come into it and i think the issue with the volcanic 
um, ash cloud was the fact that we weren't able to adequately monitor um, or at least characterize the particles and then monitor and quantify them to be able to make an accurate assessment as to risk. And so um, I think over time, technology has improved a lot in that regard, uh, both in terms of hardware and, and, and optical technology, but also in terms of uh, data. So in actually data gathering, um, you know, and, and actually be able data processing uh, and, and much more faster, um, I suppose, more intelligent algorithms, which will probably be able to detect uh, uh, this uh, much, much easier. And the reason why I say that, a lot of my research is around air pollution, much more on the ground, urban air pollution. And so we, we now have technologies that can monitor, um, if you like, ambient air pollution at real time, you know, on a sort of street by street basis. Whereas, you know, you know two or three decades ago, I do that because most of the, the air pollution was very si uh, sort of fixed, uh, sparse monitoring sort of sites. So having the ability now to, to uh, if you like, introduce wireless mobile sensing networks. And in, in, a, in, in for example, with the, with the Ash Cloud, I can quite envisage sending up a fleet of drones now to do the monitoring in the regions, for example, and feed that back, which wouldn't really have been possible, at least technologically, uh, maybe 10 years ago or so. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, uh, Aidan, Ahmed has a question. He says, what does it actually mean when I'm told 10 millimetres of rain has fallen? Well, that essentially uh, is how much rain, rain if, if it didn't drain away, if it didn't evaporate, that's how much rain you'd be standing in on the ground. So you'd have uh, uh, one centimetre or 10 millimetres of rain on the ground. Um, and you'd collect that in a rain gauge. That's how we know later how much rain has fallen. You collect it in a rain gauge and, and you measure it that way. Um, the wettest day on record in the UK was on the uh, 3rd or 4th of October last year. And that's the wettest, there's two definitions of wettest day, but this is the wettest day in which the most amount of rain fell across the whole of the UK. Averaged across the whole of the UK, uh, it came to 31 millimetres. And so if you imagine none of that rain were to drain away, none of it were to evaporate, a, a level surface of, of just over three centimetres of rain covering the whole of the UK, enough to more than fill the, uh, the, the volume of Loch Ness. Uh, so that was the wettest day in that sense. But the wettest day in another sense was um, Cumbria in 2015, I think Honister Pass, where they had... Uh, 341 millimetres of rainfall in the space of 24 hours. Brilliant. Thank you, Ahmed. I hope that uh, uh, was, uh, it the was it the answer you were looking for. Well, even if it wasn't the answer you were looking for, it's the answer you're going to get because it's the correct answer. Um, so this is, uh, uh, Mark, I'd like to talk to you. This is uh, I'm going to with Tom Thomas's question, actually. Thomas wants to know more a little bit about um, understanding uh, how pollution affects temperature from the perspective of, uh, of climate change. Uh, he wants to know uh, the why he said, I understand how pollution affects temperature with global warming, but I wonder if you could talk about how it affects wider climate change okay um what well wider wider climate change i, I'm, I'd have to I suppose what I'm saying that understands the idea of something getting warmer so the idea of uh the co2 and yeah. the insulation yeah. so i presume it's also in terms of when we see areas which get more extreme weather that might not so, so I, I hope i'm guessing this right thomas but more extreme weather which might not be hotter weather but for instance when we see blizzards when we see in, you know th those kind of incidents okay so i mean i suppose um when you think about the the, the climate system um, it is composed of a number of different sort of ecosystems, um, you know, like the cryosphere and all the ice and the hydrosphere and so on, the lithosphere. And so it's got all these various um, interconnecting systems. And so it, it, in a sense, um, that's, that's going to feed into um, different types of effects. Regarding uh, in terms of um, air pollution in particular, as we, we're, we're, we're well aware that CO2 uh, contributes to to sort of uh, global warming, and it's it's what's known as a radiatively active gas. That means it absorbs uh, thermal uh, radiation, for example. So as as the sunlight hits the Earth, um, sunlight radiates across a spectrum, and so a lot of the visible and and, and let's say uh, the visible uh, light from the sun can get some of it can get reflected and so on, 
but it's the infrared light, the thermal light, that, that actually some of these radiatively active gases absorb. CO2 is, 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 is a, a sort of a well-known candidate, but there are other candidates. Um, and air a lot of certain air pollutants, uh, like, for example, nitric oxide, nitrogen dioxide, um, sulfur, the oxides of sulfur, they're also uh, radiatively active gases. In other words, they absorb infrared radiation. Um, and there are, as a sort of general um, rule, there are many different um, uh, particles in the air that, that can absorb uh, infrared. For them to be infrared active, they have to have uh, sort of um, some sort of charge separation between the atoms. Um, but I won't go too much into that in the, in the molecule. But the point is that air pollutants, um, they can affect temperature. Um, if we take at an uh, at an urban level, at a ground level, because essentially we know that air pollution, well, air pollution is, is direct directly. We're, we're more concerned about it affecting, you know, the, the human exposure to it. So if we look at it at sort of at the lower sort of troposphere and a sort of earth boundary layer, then then air pollution itself, that can most of them NO2, SO2, as I've said, they're infrared active. So they can they can create, uh, for example, urban heat islands, whereby just as I said that the Earth reflects solar radiation or, or at least visible radiation or uh, light, let's say snow. We, we've been talking about snow, whether we know snow reflects light quite well. Uh, but then if you compare snow to, say, uh, the sea, uh, then the sea would, would, would not reflect as well uh, and, and so would absorb more. And that, that extra heat goes into heating the earth sort of globally and collectively. And so, um, and so when that earth heats up, it will then re-radiate this infrared, this thermal heat, which then gets reabsorbed by these pollutants uh, in the ground, uh, sorry, in the air, in the atmosphere. And so um, in a way, there's this feedback process, a feedback mechanism between uh, these radiatively active gases um, and then feeding back to reheating. Um, obviously, water, again, is also a, 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 a gas that absorbs infrared. So the more of that you have in the atmosphere, the more that that could also feed into this uh, sort of heating um, mechanism. So in a sense, I think air pollution, uh, it, it, it has an, an impact on human health, but it also um, can feed quite directly into um, heating uh, the troposphere in particular. And then in, in condensed urban areas where you get a lot of air pollution that's generated from things like traffic and so on. Um, and then given the fact that if you think about uh, inner cities or, or cities generally, they're effectively going to be, let's consider them as more like grey, so they're going to absorb more than, say, a leafy sort of rural area. So all of these factors coming together will create these urban sort of, uh, these temperature differentials. And I'm sure if, I mean, I, I have a lot of family in Nottingham. Whenever I used to <laughs> drive from London um, uh, up to see my family, there was always like at least one or two degrees difference in temperature the further um, north you went and it wasn't just of the fact that it was further north it's the fact that I was coming from the center of London going to somewhere um, which is not as as sort of um, uh, sort of urbanized shall we say I hope that kind of adds to you know where, to, to the general answer or gives them a flavor of it at least what's lovely about an answer like that is there's, there's lots of places now for people to go as well and just go right i want to research more you know Absolutely. and find out more so that that was great thank you very much now this is kind of a, a a beverage break now you go to your fridge and get your milk because this is uh a question that's been I mean, we haven't had time to do it for a while it's the reason that uh, helen this morning was going to re read a work of great literature but instead has been just kind of throwing milk all over her flat because if you saw our encore show that we did after the 25 hour show it's Turned out we didn't fit everything into the 25 hours. So we did another kind of four hour show uh, the week after. And uh, and in that show, Helen talked about some milk frothing experiments. And uh, Eileen, in particular, and other people in that chat area, really wanted to know more about these milk frothing experiments and also about the science behind milk microphone formation. So, uh, Helen, is today the day? Uh, yeah, so I I have a bit of a demonstration, but the full thing takes a bit longer. So what we are going to do is make a little video and put it on YouTube. But we can do the basics, and I will show you a little bit of the doing this morning, and uh, which you can all try at home. I mean, we could all try and cloud source this, but basically this is what I spent my morning doing with a few more rulers and cameras. I've been measuring out 
a hundred milliliters of milk and I've got a little frother thing that I was given as a present for once it does that and I have been frothing milk for 20 seconds um different types of milk uh I most mostly don't I don't ever drink eat cow's milk these days but I bought some for this so different types of cow's milk different types of non-dairy milk and the game is if you froth for 20 seconds how much froth do you generate so I'm not sure what this is going to do to the microphone but I'll start okay so while that's doing I can keep talking. So what the problem is here, people like, this is a bit awkward, people like froth in their cappuccino, right? Or their uh, hot chocolate. I'm more of a hot chocolate person. Oh, and then it spits everywhere. So what I, the measure I used was, um, this has got slightly higher, not very, this, this one is not an enthusiastic one, but the froth adds a bit of air, um, you know, plumps it up basically, reduces the density. And so what I've been measuring is the extra, the, the, the height difference between the milk at the start and the milk at the end. Now, this will all be explained in the video, but here's what's going on with milk froth. There are two things in milk um, that are of use. There are proteins and there are fats. And it is the case that the, what the frother does is put bubbles in there. The bubbles are the, pretty much the same for all of these milks. Uh, that's not, so the bubbles are the same. The question is, do they join together and do they stay stable? Because if those bubbles join together and then just move up to the top and burst, you've lost your gas and, and your foam is rubbish. What you want is for your bubbles to stay small because that keeps them in the middle of the milk and you want them to last for a long time. And the way that the thing that can keep a bubble lasting for a long time is a coating. Coatings can be either proteins or fats. In the ocean, they can be loads of things, but in milk, it's protein or fat. So it is a bit complicated, but here's the way it works. Through temperatures, protein is really good at forming a little coat. And uh, uh, so cold milk is really good at forming foam. But as you heat things up, the fat, which was little little solid droplets actually starts to melt and as it starts to melt it gets in the way of the protein it breaks up the nice little protein coat if you have um slightly warmer milk actually it's good but if you heat it up if you keep heating it up then all that fat melts and you don't it doesn't need the protein because the fat can coat and protect the bubbles and so then you have fat coated bubbles in very hot milk so if you have whole milk that is very warm that tends to make very good foam um if you have skimmed milk then it's a bit rubbish because the fat and the protein are, are kind of competing with each other um and it turns out so i have i've, I've written about this before i had never tried the non-dairy milks and i thought that'd be an interesting you know because because basically um skim semi skimmed and whole milk that's nice and simple they've basically got the same you know it's the same kind of stuff that's just more or less fat nice and easy the non-dairy milks are a right mixture it turns out they're really complicated because they've got all kinds of stabilizers in them which also make bubbles better uh, they've got odd ratios of protein to fat um so what i'm finding with the non-dairy milks is that they're doing all sorts of things that don't follow the pattern but i think it's because there's extra stabilizers in them which are better at making bubbles and so what's coating the bubbles isn't just the fat and protein in a dairy milk it's all this other stuff so basically what you need to do and i think this is what that you sometimes see barista oat milk i basically think they've they've made milk bubble bath milk substitute bubble bath um in, a, in an edible way um but they've put stabilizers in there that will keep the milk in there so anyway it's a bit complicated frother i encourage you to heat milk up, try different milks try this for yourself you'll find the one thing this doesn't take into account is how big the bubbles are because i'm just measuring total volume um but it is really interesting and it's not straightforward but in general uh really nice warm whole cow's milk if you drink that seems to be a good thing and then the non-dairy milk seem to vary a lot with brand and we'll put it all online but that's the, that's the milk summary for today thank you very much eat your heart out channel for sunday brunch and uh, the uh, we're, I'm going to right this question for you, Aidan. Hannah would like to know why does it always rain on Bank Holiday Monday? Uh, well, actually, that's probably down to the fact Bank that Holiday Monday. Certainly, August Bank Holiday Monday is badly placed in the calendar. Now, when you think about it, there are three Bank Holidays in the winter. There are three Bank Holidays in the spring. Only one Bank Holiday in the summer. And where do they put it? Right at the end of August. Now, the summer, when you think about it, June is typically the sunniest month. July is the um, hottest month. August is the wettest summer month. Not only that, but much of the rain in August happens in the second half of the month. And there's a reason for that. 
it's because it's the time of year that you get more activity in the Atlantic hurricane season. And these hurricanes can then end up into the mid latitudes and the temperature gradient between their extraordinary energy and humidity clashes with cooler air further north and fires up the jet stream and that then sends storms our way which can of course be remnants of ex-hurricanes themselves there was a famous one in 1986 ex-hurricane charlie that brought an absolute august bank holiday washout so i'm blaming the fact that august bank holiday is right at the end of the summer when it's normally the wettest part of the summer and of course it's the only one we get in the summer so it might be because Hannah said, is it merely because we always in the same way we notice the the late trains or whatever it might be? So she was interested. Is it actually not wetter? That, but it turns out it is likely to be wetter. I'd say it is. And, uh, you know, Hannah's not the only person to have asked this question about whether certain times of year have certain types of weather. There was a climatologist called Hubert Lamb, who back in 1950 looked at 60 years of weather patterns and found that at certain times of the year you get certain recurring weather patterns and the end of August was identified as quite stormy the first storms of the autumn it was called so uh, not an ideal place to uh, position a bank holiday brilliant thank you very much and uh, this is a just reminder everyone by the way uh can send in questions if you want to just uh, tweet us at Cosmic Shambles uh, or put them in the live chat and uh, also a reminder thank you very much to everyone who supports us via Patreon we've got loads of new Patreon things coming up including a new series with uh, Tim Minchin and astronaut Nicole Stott and Andrean and Neil Gaiman and Francesca Stavrokopoulou and and many others and uh, that's a Patreon exclusive as is the Uncanny Hour series with uh, Stuart Lee Alan Moore Reece Shearsmith and many others now this is uh, Owen Patterson uh, Mark uh, he said when he found out that you were on the show he was really interested in finding out about your work and he started googling and particularly intrigued he wants to know more about real-time particle pollution mapping how does that work okay so um i alluded to slightly um if you have let's say a fixed grid of pollution sensors uh, in a very sort of manhattan style grid and they were all collecting pollution data in real time then you could develop what uh, what we'll call a pollution map you could you could develop um, visualization of a bit like a weather map, I suppose, uh, but a pollution map where you could see the localized pollution varying over time and space. And that would be really powerful uh, information for like local authorities and so on, so that they could start to make real time decisions, maybe rerouting traffic or whatever it may be to limit the impact uh, to, to human exposure, if you like, which ultimately is what we want to at least do at the very minimum. Um, but the question is a dense grid. Of, ex, uh, of sensors would be too uh, resource heavy and too costly. So then the question asks, well, can we, let's say we had a hundred sensors, a 10 by 10 grid, and they were fixed there. Could we get the same level of representativeness from say 10 sensors that were moving up and down, let's say, for example. So in a, in a way, what you're moving then from is from a, a fixed network to a sort of moving mobile uh, network and then the next question is, well, rather than them moving up and down, maybe they move in a in a sort of encyclical paths. And then eventually what happens if they move in irregular paths? So then what you've done, you've, you've sort of my, sort of migrated from a fixed network to an ad hoc mobile wireless network. And then you can start to think about, well, imagine if we could, you know, if we could get the sensors small enough and accurate enough we could uh, you know, populate a fleet of taxis and buses or maybe even people themselves if we could get them to that size. And then you've got this, this very rich data set, um, which could get, then give you the real, get, get a real insight into the dynamics of pollution. And also not just from an academic point of view to understand all the, the various things that are happening, but also to be able to mitigate against the effects. So in a sense, my own research, I started off as an undergraduate chemist um, probably asked why too much times and ended up doing a PhD in physics, which often happens, uh, but then ended up um, really um, sort of going in, looking into um, uh, instrumentation, optics and so on. And, uh, you know, I was really a bit you know, fascinated by quantum mechanics and the whole spectroscopy and, and how that all works. But then over time, it's now progressed. Uh, we, we developed and, and I co-founded the technology business that, that, that monitors um, and maps, you know, can, can do this sort of mobile sensing. But now it's more OK. Uh, most of my research is around so essentially maths and computing. So in other words, 
how can you use a, you know, a mobile data set and, and extract, uh, you know, do we still, how much information do we retain? How much information do we lose? And if so, and if we, if we can find a way of compensating for that information loss, then we're in a position to then apply that to sort of you know, an ad hoc, ad hoc network in many different ways. And going back to, like I said, the volcano ash, uh, if we had this understanding maybe then, it may well have been possible to send a fleet of drones, which would create you know, an in-the-air sort of ad hoc network, but it's the similar principles. So it's really trying to understand the dynamics of that uh, that, I, that I've been working on uh, more so than the actual instrumentation, because to a large extent, a lot of that research has been done, and it's 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 very much uh, the principle has been proven. Thank you so much. Uh, helped you there. Uh, the question now, Jill would like to know, Aidan, uh, what percentage of weather presenters are actual meteor meteorologists like you? Um, I'm not sure, to be honest, although you don't have to be a meteorologist to be a very good weather presenter. There are plenty of uh, non-meteorological, uh, very good weather presenters out there. Um, I work with two excellent uh, meteorologists and weather presenters, and um, uh, one of the, well, is my boss, I have to say, he, he's probably my favourite weather presenter. I'm just saying that because it's his birthday today, so happy birthday to him. He might be watching. <laughs> Brilliant. I, it's an interesting thing, isn't it? Because people get quite hung up on that about whether someone's a meteorologist. But of course, news presenters for decades were just actors, you know. So, so all those news readers that you saw, you say, well, this is someone who a lot, a lot of them were just actors, you know. And, and not, I say just actors. Obviously, it's a wonderful profession. Um, the uh, Mark, let's have uh, now. This is uh, something I knew nothing about, and it was not part of my curriculum. But people get obsessed with the El Nino or El Nino, uh, uh, and I never, I never did any of that when I was a kid and uh, Jonathan wants to know uh it said I was brought up to be very worried about the El Nino is this still something to worry about what is it exactly well uh that is a uh that is a yeah tricky question I mean I I only I, I'll be honest with you I only got exposed to El Nino when I was sort of doing my PhD sort of and there was others who were working on, on that um but I, I I rather than try to answer it in an expert way when I'll openly admit I'm not an expert on El Nino. What I would say is that um, it's still just as much a concern as it was then, but I, I, I suspect that because of other things like climate change and other uh, sort of climatic effects that are also happening, that El Nino is not necessarily taking center stage uh, uh, of, of our sort of concerns. And also the other thing is that the effects of El Nino some of them are very similar to what we would see with the effects of climate change. So I think there's, there's been a, a bit of a, uh, um, let's just say, a, a, a murking of the lines between uh, the two. But back when I was uh, studying El Nino, it was, it, was, it was sort of studied as a specific phenomenon, phenomenon which it still is. Um, but I, I believe that over time, it's kind of um, uh, sort of merged into the broader sort of concern around changing weather patterns as opposed to having its own special place but uh, I, I'm, I'm quite sure Helen may be able to add one add something in that regard. Yes Helen? El Nino is a combined atmosphere and ocean thing so the full name is actually El, the El Nino Southern Oscillation and the reason for the Southern Oscillation bit is that it was originally thought it was an atmospheric phenomenon or ocean phenomenon actually they're, it's a connected system and what um, uh, Mark was talking about there is that what we're seeing is that there are these big patterns in the atmosphere. So, for example, there's a quasi biennial oscillation in the in the stratosphere somewhere that shifts around the equator, and there are patterns um, over the Atlantic, for example, between the Azores and Iceland. And and what you see is the pattern goes one way one year and one way another. There are these massive patterns in different places around the globe, and the question is how linked are they? If there is, an, if it's an El Nino year, and El Ninos have been becoming more common, you know, taught that they happened every six or seven years. But if you look at the more, more recent record, it's become more complicated than that. And actually, again, it's it's two things. El Nino is one end of the spectrum, and it swings back to something called La Nina. Um, so, that, so it kind of this pendulum of, of what's happening across the Pacific, which is to do with how water and atmosphere, whether it's whether cold water can reach, can come up from underneath to touch the atmosphere. Um, it's not just a, a lone pattern and it makes what the, there's, there's something called weather attribution. There's an enormous study of, that, that comes under this very unsexy name of weather attribution, um, attribution studies. And what, what they mean is 
So say you pick up a specific storm or a specific hurricane and you say, what caused this? Why was this one here? And you start threading, you start following back, right? And you go, well, was it because there was an El Nino this year and that pushed everything over? Was it because the monsoon was really strong? And what you find is there's all these influences that kind of nudge in from different places. I made um, a program for the BBC back in 2014, I think, uh, about, because there were a couple of really extreme weathers and we got it commissioned um, and I swear the only reason we got it commissioned was that both of us, the presenters, it was John, uh, oh, temporarily forgot his name john hammond no uh it'll come back to me but we kept quiet about how complicated it was because we knew the bbc would never commission it if we really told them how hard it was and what they wanted to know was why was this winter this bad and it's really difficult to say like you can say well it's more likely when el nino is like this it's more likely when the monsoon is like this but what you hard to say is uh, it was precisely precisely because this happened, because the weather, the global weather is one interconnected system. So weather scientists have this very annoying habit. Of, you, you know, just now we're starting to get studies which say, was this storm worse because of climate change? And we are just about at the point where for some storms in very specific conditions, you can say the rainfall was probably 20 percent heavier just due to climate change or make similar statements. But it's really difficult to be. Absolutely. Exact. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And the other thing is, of course, that El, thing is, of course, that El Nino, it, there is sort of periodic sea surface temperature changes that are linked to El Nino. And so when you're trying to understand that in the context of a broader climate change as well uh, and trying to decouple that, I, I think that also adds to the complexity. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, it's probably not a, a, a sort of, a, a, you know, a, a really detailed answer, but I think it is something that is very much still prevalent. It didn't just disappear, uh, but as Helen said, it, it, the, the complexity of it and the fact that it's it's linked to so many other systems um, within our climate system um, makes it um, extremely difficult to sort of pinpoint a particular event and say this is specifically because of El Nino. I've got to to make sure you can make that show, even though you weren't entirely sure you're going to be able to deliver it. Uh, a friend of mine, Christopher Sykes, who made, amongst other things, Pleasure of Finding Things Out with Richard Feynman, uh, he and Nicholas Humphrey in the 1980s Channel 4 said, oh, Nicholas, do you want to make a uh, maybe a six-part series about human consciousness? And he went, yeah, sure. <laughs> now that was, and if you ever get it, it's online, you can see it on YouTube. It's this beautiful story of basically them going, how do we turn human, oh my God. And eventually, go, well, we better do something. So let's go to Tahiti. So then, because they, they looked at the just sort of work of going, it's a really interesting series to watch from the 80s. I wish I could make it's not consciousness regained, but have a look, Nick Humphrey and uh, and Christopher Sykes. And it's a fascinating thing when you see those beautiful days of television where people just would have a drink and go, why don't you go off and make that? That would be fun. Um, and every now and again, you can see the struggle of trying to visualize over six hours what human consciousness really is and what we understand about it. Um, now, uh, Aidan, for you, Lorraine has uh, a question question she says i know robin and helen always say there's no such thing as a silly question but this might be the exception to the rule but i don't think it is actually uh she lorraine says that her, her mother is very superstitious and uh, she was wondering if any of the old wives tales about weather actually have some truth in it such as cows all sitting down if it's going to rain people's arthritis getting worse before a storm uh and also on top of that do you have a favorite strange weather superstition actually quite a lot of these weather superstitions are surprisingly true particularly the ones that relate to looking to the skies and looking at different clouds that are arriving for example there's one that says something like mackerel skies and mares tails lofty ships um low sails and that's because mackerel skies that's the type of cloud that is quite scaly it's an alter cumulus cloud mare's tails relates to the kind of very high up icy cirrus clouds and you get those types of clouds often ahead of weather systems that could bring stormy weather and so lofty ships might need to lower their sails um red sky at night that's another one that is kind of based on reality because in the evening when you're looking to the west sunset. If you've got some high clouds behind you, then you'll have a nice red sky as the sun is reflected off those uh, high clouds. And normally that means because our weather goes from west to east, the clouds and the storms are going that way. And so you're looking at a better day tomorrow. Red sky in the morning, the opposite is true because of course, 
you're looking to the east, you've now got the clouds coming in from the west. So there is some uh, truth in that uh, saying. Um, there's one about the uh, halo around the moon and um, rain soon. And that's another one where you've got high cloud coming in. So when you're looking at the skies and people have been using these proverbs for for many, many years before we knew anything about weather forecasting. But they obviously they obviously knew how to look to the skies. Um, the arthritis one is interesting, actually, because there has been some recent research that has suggested that low pressure and humidity can make uh, joints and tendons swell a bit more, particularly when pressure is lowering quickly. And so when it's windy, for example, so a windy, humid day might be a bit more uncomfortable for people who suffer from arthritis. Uh, the cows lying down, I'm pretty sure there's no truth in that. They, they uh, you know, lie down for all sorts of reasons. The only weather related thing that might uh, hold true for cows is that apparently they tend to stand up more when it's hot because uh, it, it's a better way of cooling down for them. But um, whether that's a sign of fine weather coming in uh, and, and things like berries on trees and pine cones and all of that sort of thing, that's more based on current or recent weather rather than their ability to predict weather. So I think anything that talks about things in the sky and clouds probably okay but when you're looking at nature it's a bit dubious sometimes it's interesting when you say about the fact you know before there was weather forecasting and, and i think we see that so much in some of the histories that have come out in the last 10 20 years about you know groups of people who had previously you know in in, in history been discounted as being oh these primitives people and you start to actually look at the, the myths and you start to look at how an understanding of the world was created, which was far more intricate than the, uh, you know, very dismissive kind of what you'd like to think of, you know, the, the uh, cravatted uh, Victorian scientist. And yeah, there's there's so many interesting, I highly recommend the book uh, Dark Emu, which I mentioned before, which is particularly about um, in terms of uh, understanding of, of, of science in Australia amongst the indigenous people. Um, we've almost run out of time. And I think this question for you, Mark, I, I'm right, you've got two minutes and I think it's quite a tough one to do in two minutes, but you're <laughs> going to prove me wrong because this is uh, about uh, atmosphere. Does it rotate with the earth or does it stay in a fixed position? I think that's such an interesting thing. When It's a bit like when people think if a plane just stayed where it was, would it eventually arrive at the destination because the earth would keep moving? It's an interesting understanding mm. of, of what a planet and an atmosphere is. So <clears throat> how does atmosphere move with the earth beneath it? Okay, okay. So, in my usual style, I will not answer the question specifically <laughs> uh, because it's too complicated. However, I will I will give a flavour of a few things to think about. So, the Earth is rotating, and um, and so we've got this this atmosphere, which is obviously you know envelopes our Earth. And so uh, you're asking if 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 they will rotate at the same rate, and then you'd have to really think about the if you like the forces that are that are keeping the atmosphere where it is. Um, if you are into thermodynamics, one thing to think about is, is the atmosphere a sort of open or a closed system or an isolated system? In other words, can matter go in and out of the atmosphere as ra or, and, and, and radiation or not? Uh, these things will help to understand, uh, if you like, the coupling between the atmosphere and the Earth in terms of uh, its, its rotation. Uh, if rotate with the Earth, um, I suppose, of course, it, it it can, but the question is, does it rotate at the same rate as the Earth? Um, well, that that uh, that. Uh, okay, <laughs> I don't want to give you a definitive yes or no because I want to. I, maybe I'm being a bit more in a sort of uh, a sort of teacher mode where you want the you know the listener to actually look into these things themselves because I think that's how you get the most out of. I think I think uh, if it. If it didn't rotate with the Earth, then I suppose you want to ask, well, what would be the consequence? Uh, and then see if you observe the consequence of what you think would happen. So in other words, for example, if you think, well, OK, it doesn't rotate with the Earth and the atmosphere is almost fixed and the Earth just sort of rotates, uh, then uh, what would that mean in terms of weather, in terms of what we experience, for example? So I, I'm, I'm going to leave it in a more of an open way because we've only got two minutes and we're literally at the end uh, to say uh, that these are the types of things that by asking the right questions, you can actually 
get further to answering the question, the original question that you posed, and that is the beauty of science. I love that. This is uh, Jan 11 when I was in which scientist it was who whenever he would return home uh his mother would always say when he got back from school she would always say did you ask any good questions today not you know how did you do at school or did you do any good did you ask any good questions um now this unfortunately Aiden, means i'm just going to quickly crowbar this one in as well so you haven't quite got out of it yet uh this is uh from matt because he's also also emailed this to us and uh, just popped up in the live chat Matt, it's just interesting, and I know this again is a big can of worms, but why is medium range weather forecasting so difficult? Ah, that's a, that's a great question. I, actually, um, Helen was talking about some of these big things that happen in our atmosphere thousands of miles away, and, and that's one tool that we use for medium range forecasting. For example, this winter we've looked at La Nina, and that has some correlation with the UK weather during winter, it tends to bring wetter and milder end to winters, but not always because there are other things. For example, there is a strong circulation above the North Pole and the stratosphere, and sometimes that breaks down and that can lead to very cold weather in the UK. And we saw that at the beginning of January, it's something called sudden stratospheric warming. And that gives an increased probability of cold weather at the end of winter. So you have these competing factors and it's about which one will win. You've also got computer models, which uh, become more and more uncertain as they look further and further ahead because of something called chaos theory. So that basically means that very small errors at the beginning of a forecast, because we cannot have a complete understanding of every atom and every molecule in our atmosphere, you're going to have small errors at the beginning of a forecast. When you extrapolate those forwards, then the forecast will become increasingly chaotic. It will diverge in very, very different ways. Uh, certainly beyond a week, different computer models start saying very different things because they have very subtle changes at the beginning. And we get around this slightly by running ensembles. So we run a computer model 30 times with very slight changes at the beginning of each forecast and see what most of them are saying. Sometimes they'll all say a different thing and we'll be very uncertain. Other times they'll all say a similar thing and then we can say with a high uh, confidence that a certain weather event will happen. Thank you so much. Thank you both very much for joining us, uh, to Aidan and Mark. And uh, I want to get one of those things that's Maxwell Equation. Thing. It looks fantastic because I really do want to understand more about that. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. I'll just quickly tell you coming up in the next week, as I said, tomorrow, or at least sometime in the next 24 hours, there'll be uh, a compilation of the first series of Uncanny Hour uh, with Stuart Lee and Alan Moore and Stacia from Hawkwind and Stephen Morris from uh, New Order and Kayla Janice and Carrie Thompson, Joanna Neary and many others and Charlie Higson. Uh, Rhys Shearsmith. Uh, book Shambles next week is Marion Keyes. Uh, Josie Long and I had a chat with her. It's really fascinating. She's such an interesting author, such a, someone, and there were so many different ideas that uh, that she talked about. So Book Shambles with Marion Keyes. Uh, Friday will be the new Uncanny Hour uh, on John Carpenter's uh, Apocalypse Trilogy. All I've got to do to we nearly finished that. I've just got to record a conversation with Alan Moore about H.P. Lovecraft's Cosmicism. So that could be a very interesting and uh, it may well be the thing that I'm not here next week because I'll have accidentally opened up some kind of portal to a hellscape um, and we'll be back next week with uh, I, I think we're mainly talking about sharks at 3pm uh, next Sunday so uh, do your research uh, I would highly recommend the majority of the Sharknado films uh, the final in the series does deal with uh, time travel um, if not I would say the best of the Shark Attack series is Shark Attack 2 with John Barrowman uh, which uh, is a lot of, Helen you do not the Sharknado films you believe are, are some Scientifically. Just to wind me up. I and love the Sharknado films. Up. <laughs> just the word Sharknado is something I object to. <laughs> well, we will be dealing Sharks with the, the science. Nasty monsters. They are brilliantly clever, fantastically adapted to the ocean, machines of the deep. Yeah, but I, I think from a natural history perspective, once we realise that they've been picked up in a tornado and then wreak havoc in Washington, New York and LA, I'm already accepting that I should not use any of these in my open university examinations, okay? Have anyway, you so talking about Sharknado yet? Anyway, so I would say don't go to Sharknado 3. That's got Ann Coulter in it. I think that was a mistake in casting to have that kind of, uh, you know, level. Uh, but Sharknado 1, Sharknado 2, and the last Sharknado, very strong. Also on the physics, dealing with the time travel elements, uh, Helen. So just when you think you're annoyed about the way they deal with sharks, they also break the laws of physics in the final one. It's like they're making them for you. Not listening. <laughs>
I'm not listening. Thanks very much for joining us. Uh, Samuel, jo- Samuel Jackson was in a film with, with, with sharks in it called Deep Blue Sea. It was quite quite good. There's an interesting scene. Oh yeah, yeah. that's that that's got that has got a great yeah. There His you go. demise is a is a tip top demise. Um I mean, anyway, thanks very much that, for joining us. If you remember what happened to Samuel, I want to know if that's scientifically possible. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think generally we can accept that most shark films are not particularly literate when it comes to the actual science of the deep and the nature of sharks. But then again, you know, what would yours be if it just, oh, there goes the shark. Seems happy. You know, Robert Shaw needs an angry demise. Thanks very much to our producer, Trent Burton. Thanks to everyone who supports us via Patreon as well. Um, we'll see you sometime during the week or next week. <laughs>